Now that's not evidence, that's just an argument. But the cool thing about this, it is enables you to test this argument by holding these two up. If you take, if the intelligent design guys are right, the parts of these complex machines should be useless on their own. But if evolution is right, these parts should turn out to do other jobs in the cell. So let's check it out. Let's see exactly what happens. Let's start with that bacterial flagellum. There it is, and this is from a biochemical review article. It's got about 30 different proteins, so let's do an experiment. Let's take away not one part, not two or three. Let's take away all but 10 of its parts. Now, the cool thing about computers is they make these experiments really easy. Watch this. Whoops, there they go. So I've taken away all but 10 parts, and the 10 I've left are the 10 that span the biological membrane. Here is a, another review showing exactly what these 10 parts are. Well, if intelligent design argument is right, then what's left behind, because we've taken all these parts away, this should be non-functional. But it turns out it's not non-functional. These 10 proteins perform to the cell that has them an absolutely vital function that has nothing to do with flagellar motility. They make something up called the type 3 secretory system, which is a little molecular syringe that really nasty bacteria use to pump our cells full of poisons and to kill them. Now, these 10 parts have nothing to do with flagellar movement, but they are still functional. So what does that do to the argument? Remember what the argument was. Any precursor to an irreducibly complex system that is missing a part is by definition non-functional. There's the complex system. This guy is missing 20 parts. Is it non-functional? Uh-uh, it is perfectly functional. So what that tells us is this statement, which is not a peripheral one, this is the heart and soul of the intelligent design argument, it tells us that statement is wrong. There is no other word for it. And it turns out when we analyze the bacterial flagellum itself, these are the proteins associated with the type 3 secretory apparatus, but it turns out just about every other protein in the flagellum actually has a function of its own in a system elsewhere in the cell unrelated to flagellar movement. And you know what that means? It means that when we actually analyze the flagellum, it fits the evolution prediction, which is that the parts should have functions of their own. And so they do. Now, the flagellum is not the only argument where this breaks down. These guys make the same argument about the complex series of proteins that clot the blood. If you are missing even one of these proteins, your blood doesn't clot properly. That part is true. So the argument is made that these proteins are only used to clot blood in the absence of any of the components. Blood does not clot and the system fails. Evolution, therefore, couldn't have produced it because it would have to produce all the parts at the same time rather than to produce a few gradually. Um, and in fact, the textbook called Pandas and People that is used for intelligent design classes makes exactly the same argument. You need all the parts in working order. All the proteins have to be present simultaneously or blood clotting doesn't work. It's a bold claim and it would be a powerful argument against evolution if it were true, but it ain't. And it turns out we can do an experiment and check. Here is a drawing showing all these complicated proteins. So let's eliminate one component. And I'm going to pick a protein called factor 12. Very important because it actually starts the cascade. So let's eliminate it. Again, these experiments are easy to do in PowerPoint. There they go. It's gone. Will the blood clot? Well, the answer turns out to be yes. Whales and dolphins, in fact, lack factor 12 right at the molecular level. They don't have the gene for it. This turns out to be an adaptation for deep sea diving. But it also means that they can miss a component and their blood doesn't clot. Well, maybe they got it wrong. Maybe you can eliminate one component. OK, fair enough. So this time, let's go a little farther, and let's eliminate three parts. And the three parts I want to eliminate are this entire cascade up here. Now let's see what happens. Well, it turns out that puffer fish lack all three of these parts. There's a puffer fish for those of you who haven't gone fishing recently. Um, and it turns out they are lacking all of these components, and guess what? They have a perfectly functional clotting system. So once again, the core of this argument, which is that in the absence of any of these components, blood will not clot and the system fails, sorry, it's wrong. So all of these biochemical arguments fall apart. And actually, when you look at these systems in detail, we can actually, by comparative genetic analysis, see where the parts of the clotting system came from 
in very simple chordate animals. And we're finding more and more about the evolutionary pathway that really did produce blood clotting all the time. Now here's the question. Why does this fail? It sounded, I mean, look at the mousetrap. It sounded like such a good argument. You need all the parts or it doesn't work at all. Well, five or six years ago, I was on a television program on PBS called Firing Line, hosted by a guy named William F. Buckley, where they have these debates. And Michael Behe was there. He had a mousetrap. He made the argument about the mousetrap. I had a mousetrap in my briefcase and a pair of pliers. And to his absolute horror, I pulled the mousetrap out, a pair of pliers. I yanked one of the parts off the mousetrap and threw it away. I bent one of the other parts, and I still got the mousetrap to work. That was after his argument, you take a part away, mousetraps don't work. So I want to show you. I'm very proud of this. Um, one of my great scientific achievements. Um, what I did was I took out the bait holder. And as it turns out, if you take the hold down bar and you twist it, so it just goes under the spring, you have a four-part mousetrap. And lo and behold, if you have a really stupid mouse, and he comes up and bumps this to the side when he takes the bait, the hammer goes down, and he'll be just as dead as if he was killed with a five-part mousetrap. So it's not true that the four parts wouldn't have a function. I thought it was pretty clever. But then I got an email about a week later from a guy at University of Delaware named John McDonald. He's the clever guy. John said, Dear Ken, I liked your four-part mousetrap demonstration on the TV show. Nice job. But why'd you stop there? Why didn't you take another part away to make a three-part mousetrap, which would also hold bait and catch mice, and when that had sunk in, take another part away, you can make a perfectly good two-part mousetrap. Mouse comes over, bumps the cheese, this thing comes down, and finally, the ultimate, which is the one-part mousetrap. Um, and therefore, this argument about all the parts having to be there is fictitious. Now, there's a better point than that. Some of you may have noticed that I've been wearing what you, you, look, what you think is a mousetrap as a tie clip. Well, it's actually not a mousetrap. Um, I've taken two parts and thrown them away. So I only have three parts here. I have the base plate, the spring, and the catch. You can't catch many mice with this, but it makes a perfectly functional, if not very elegant or attractive, tie clip. And that's the point, which is that the parts of a supposedly irreducibly complex machine can be used for different purposes. And in fact, if you have just two parts, you can even make a keychain out of my strap. And I'll be selling these later on on the way out in case you'd like to buy any of these. Um, so the point to be made is the mousetrap, ironically, is a perfect argument for evolution because it shows how the parts of what is supposedly an irreducibly complex machine can actually be used for other purposes. And you can look at what some of these other purposes are directly in the slide. And you might like to try some of them yourself with the permission, of course, of your parent or guardian. So the mousetrap example un uh, unexpectedly provides a perfect argument in favor of evolution. Now, the last thing that happened at the Dover trial is it exposed intelligent design as a religious doctrine masquerading as science, and a very particular religious doctrine at that. How did we establish that? Was it by the expert testimony on our side of the case? Actually, no. It turned out that the best argument for that was the expert testimony on the other side of the case. And that is, when we got the expert witnesses for the other side on the stand, look what they said. Behe said it's implausible that the designer is natural, therefore he's got to be supernatural. Another witness said that for intelligent design to be considered science, we've got to change the ground rules of science so that supernatural forces can be counted as part of science. And another witness said the whole idea of ID is to change the ground rules of science so that it includes the supernatural. We didn't have to make the case. It was just a question of putting these guys in the stand and just keep talking. Tell us all about it. And lo and behold, supernatural forces, as many religious people might say, might be real, but they're certainly not part of science. So considering them as science, I think, profanes religion and corrupts science. There was a perfect example of that during the trial. Dr. Behe was questioned about how if you change the ground rules of science so that supernatural forces needed for intelligent design can be considered science, wouldn't it mean that other forces can be counted as scientific as well? And in particular, it was pointed out to him that astrology would fall as a science by his definition. And to everyone's absolute astonishment, when he was asked this question, he agreed with the assertion that under his definition, astrology would count as a science and could be taught in scientific classrooms. Whenever I speak to gatherings 
of teachers or lay people interested in education, I always try to remind them that the leading scientific expert in favor of intelligent design, under oath, 